Good morning, everybody. Just um, welcoming you to this uh, deep dive um, urban greening factor webinar. Um, I'm Claire Warburton uh, and I'm the chair of the session today. So very warm welcome. Um, Principal advisor for green infrastructure in natural England. We hope you will um, find this webinar inspiring um, and that you will gain the clarity that you need uh, to develop your own urban greening factor policy in time. So uh, welcome. Um, and just to give a little bit of an overview uh, then of the urban greening factor and how that sort of sits within the context of uh, the work that Natural England has done on the green infrastructure framework. So we have developed a, a national urban greening factor for England uh, as one of a suite of five headline green infrastructure standards within the, the framework. Um, as you know, um, urban greening factors um, re relatively uh, simple to use, and that's what we're hoping to unpack today uh, and can be used uh, when combined with other sort of planning measures can significantly increase urban greening in an area and support the delivery of mandatory biodiversity net gain as well. So we've got um, a packed agenda for you this morning um, and we're going to um, go to um, first of all to Peter Neal who is the landscape architect and author of the Green Infrastructure Frameworks Urban Greening Factors for England, uh, the user guide. Uh, Peter is an environmental planner with over 25 years professional experience across the public, private and charitable sectors uh, and today he'll provide a comprehensive overview of the urban greening factor. So Peter, over to you. Yeah, thanks Claire. Good morning everybody. Um, delighted to be able to join you on this deep dive uh, seminar on the urban greening factor, which I have spent a fair bit of time with Natural England doing uh, research in developing a, a national model um, for urban greening. Um, let me begin um, and uh, we are clear of the principle uh, of what we're trying to achieve with an urban greening factor is to make places better, uh, more resilient, um, more attractive for people, for biodiversity and uh, far better places to live. And uh, so I think these slides kind of give you a flavour, a cross section of urban, uh, suburban, uh, semi, semi rural locations. Um, principally development for, for housing, but an urban greening factor works across a variety of different land uses, focusing particularly on commercial development, uh, but principally on residential development. And so let's move to the next slide. Um, and this will just give you uh, a position of the urban greening factor within the suite of green infrastructure standards that uh, Natural England launched uh, in January, at the beginning of this year. Uh, and you can see standard four, um, uh, bottom left, uh, it gives you um, the position of the urban greening factor along with um, the requirement to set uh, a green infrastructure strategy, the accessible green space standards in terms of access to, to green space, urban tree canopy cover, uh, and also uh, an urban nature recovery standard. And just towards the end of my presentation, I will talk a bit about how the urban greening factor connects with one or two of these other standards. And so if we pop to the next slide. We have um, just a summary here of what I would like to cover. Um, we are really fortunate because we're going to have a more detailed uh, in-depth review um, from both Southampton and London with the GLA um, uh, following my presentation that will talk about how they have specifically developed their own green space factor or urban greening factor. Um, I want to give you the context, the overview, uh, and so I will talk about its evolution, both uh, abroad as well as at the UK, how it is structured, and that's principally about um, uh, surface cover types and weightings, and then how you calculate an urban greening factor for a development. And then we will look at um, uh, how you can uh, calculate, measure an urban greening factor and then fit that to policy. And so as we move on to the next slide, we know what we are seeking to achieve. And I think these uh, two images explain that we want much more of 
the type of development on the right, which really integrates uh, green infrastructure provision across uh, the development process, rather than uh, what we often see on development on the left, where landscape and green infrastructure sometimes is a, a bolt on an additional uh, part of the master planning process. And an urban greening factor not only allows you to measure the quantum of greening for development, which is incredibly important, but it also helps use it as a tool to negotiate and discuss the evolution of green infrastructure proposals for development. Uh, and I think that's incredibly important part of that. So it's a dialogue and a mechanism. Uh, it's a tool for dialogue and a mechanism to measure greening. And then we move to the next slide and we see here um, the evolution, the early uh, sort of start of uh, an interest in developing a tool for urban greening uh, within a biotope area factor developed in Berlin. Um, Berlin, dense urban um, city constrained politically um, uh, in the last uh, century um, and so they had to maximize greening within the urban core or the fabric uh, and uh, the tool was part of a landscape planning program for the city but also a tool to focus and prioritize greening where it was needed the most in those dense urban mid to high-rise uh, apartment block developments and then as we move to the next slide the the tool um, uh, was picked up um, by Malmo as they were developing their proposals for the BO01 2001 Housing Expo on the Western Harbour, an area of post-industrial uh, regeneration on the edge of Malmo. And they were really interested to see how they could promote not only innovative models of housing, but also integrate a rich uh, landscape, green infrastructure provision and a more functional uh, green fabric for the housing expo. And so they really drew on um, uh, the work in Berlin um, and then Malmo and Berlin have become the sort of foundation points for the evolution uh, of an urban greening factor uh, across Europe more abroad and then uh, inspired uh, its development within the UK. And so the timeline on the next slide gives you a flavour of Berlin starting in the late 90s, mid to late 90s, with Malmo picking that up at the turn of the century. And as you run down through, it was really not until um, 2015 when Southampton uh, started to develop its own um, urban greening factor or green space factor, which Lindsay is going to tell us uh, more about. And as you work down through City of London and the GLA starts incorporating that into established policy. Prior to that, some early work by the NWDA and the Mersey Forest explored the potential of, of some form uh, of a green infrastructure score uh, that they were interested to uh, develop. And so as we move on, uh, there is a good range of research available in addition to the work that um, Natural England uh, with myself and colleagues from, from other consultancies have supported uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, two uh, EU funded programs, the GRABS and the PERFECT programs, provide you with really good two points of literature. And if you want to read two useful articles, these are the ones to start with and then move on to the work that Natural England has published, because this gives you that background and that um, international context, really useful, uh, easily, uh, easy read, accessible um, pieces of research uh, on, on the background. Uh, but as we look abroad and as we move to the next slide, you can see uh, across Europe and then further afield into North America and then Australasia, um, different versions of urban greening factors have emerged as a means to promote and measure and uh, maintain uh, the provision of green infrastructure through urban development. At the heart, this is an aspiration to green our cities and make them uh, more attractive, but more res resilient, particularly in the light of the impact of climate change. But you've got a coefficient of biotope from Paris, not dissimilar to the Berlin model, through to Helsinki, Toronto and Melbourne. And then if we move um, onto the next slide, 
Um, this gives you a flavor, say, of the Helsinki uh, Finland Green Factor method, which was particularly looking at its functionality of green infrastructure, a more sophisticated model, uh, and one that looked at ecological structure, its functionality, the aesthetic of landscape and maintenance factors that they brought that together uh, in terms of an assessment through an expert score and then individual scores for specific sites. But it was trying to reinforce that, as you see on the plan here, those green urban fingers reaching down into the heart of the city and ensuring that investment in green infrastructure was targeted to strengthen those green fingers, those green wedges to provide uh, a range of uh, enhanced functionality and particularly uh, delivery of better ecosystem services for climate change management. And then on the next slide, you have uh, just a very brief flavor of the City of Malmo's Green Factor tool uh, launched just last year um, and part of a suite of strategic measures that Malmo have adopted in urban greening uh, both strategically uh, pushing much more an urban forest with tree canopy cover enhanced across uh, Melbourne, uh, but also a lot of additional guidance so that they promote it through policy, promote it through guidance. And then the Green Factor tool is a means, as it says, of measuring green infrastructure credentials of your development. And so that gives you kind of flavour of that international context. And then as we switch to the UK on our next slide, um, we can see uh, the uh, uh, early examples uh, in the UK, which I will not dwell on because we have the experts in the virtual room with us today, which is great. Both Lindsay and Sam will talk about top left of Southampton uh, and uh, in the middle bottom uh, about the work uh, from uh, London um, and the GLA and an example on the right about how Swansea has used a, a, a green infrastructure strategy as the vehicle for developing a, a green space factor. And so we will then move on and uh, start to explore the component parts of the urban greening factor. And so the model policy that Natural England launched at the beginning of the year has sort of three key components that, that sit here. First is a target score for urban greening. How much or what is the quantum of green infrastructure you're seeking to uh, deliver um, within a development? And we set targets here for predominantly commercial development at 0.3, predominantly residential development at 0.4, and residential development on greenfield sites at 0.5. We'll explain in just a moment how that figure comes about now you measure it. But as a rule of thumb, you could consider that, say, a 50%, 40% or 30% greening. It doesn't quite work out through that detail, but it gives you a flavour of our desire to promote and enhance green cover, but green infrastructure and through the second element, which is a range of weighted surface cover types. Uh, and those are about vegetation and tree planting, common elements in landscape design. Uh, additional elements, particularly in urban areas, are green roofs and green walls, sustainable urban drainage and water features and paved surfaces. And those are weighted in relation to their performance. And we'll uh, look at that weighting in a moment. And then uh, as we move further down, um, the third element is where you apply that and where you're going to target the urban greening factor. And the um, model policy for England recommends this is applied to what is referred to as major development in the Planning Act. So that's housing development of 10 or more dwellings um, or uh, commercial development that has a particular size set within the slides. And I note that we're having a few um, uh, comments uh, coming into the chat and the Q&A. We will be picking those up as we go and towards the end of the uh, uh, webinar today. So thank you for the points being posted already. We'll, we'll make sure we try and cover most of those uh, before the end of the session. So let's move on to the next slide. 
and this gives us a flavor of the surface cover types of structure that we have an overview on this uh, single slide. So there are proposed 22 different surface cover types, vegetation and tree planting on the left, and then green roofs, studs and water features, and paved surfaces on the right. Now they have different weightings responding to their broader environmental benefits, social benefit, ecosystem service benefit, ecological and biodiversity benefits. So the higher the number, 1.0 for semi-natural vegetation and wetlands retained on site is much better than if you go to the bottom right-hand corner where you've got sealed paving, which nobody really wants at 0.9. You don't get any weighting for that. And you can see that weighting varies as you go through this. And I'm going to look at those in just a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides. But the weightings are used to calculate your urban greening factor score. So you time that surface cover within the master plan with that weighting and then you add those together and divide it by the total site area, which I'll show you how to do in just a moment. And let's move on to uh, the next couple of slides. Uh, very briefly, it is important we feel that these 22 surface cover types are used because they give you a broad mix uh, and range of options on urban greening. Now, it could be more comprehensive, but that gets, um, I think, overly complex in, a, in the use of the tool. But we would recommend that it isn't simplified because this gives you a flavor and a variety of different types of tree planting, the benefit of hedgerow, flowerage, meadow planting, etc. And if we move to the next slide, uh, you can see that breakdown also uh, on uh, the different types of green roofs and green walls where we favor much more the intensive green roofs than those um, ecologically poor sedum only roofs that score much lower. So that's a, an intensive roof would get a 0.8 score compared to a 0.3 weighting um, for a, a sedum only roof. And again, you can see that variety of um, weightings for the different surface cover types listed. And then if we move to the next slide, this is just a reference across to another tool um, that Natural England has been developing, um, the Environmental Benefits from Nature tool, which looks at surface cover types and habitat types in much more detail, but quantifies and assesses their ecological benefit and their uh, ecosystem service benefit. And so we've used that tool as a means to check and test the weightings that we have proposed uh, for the urban greening factor. And on the next slide, we see um, the uh, much uh, further detail on each of those surface cover types. On the left, you have a summary description of, of each. And uh, on the right, each of those surface cover types um, are uh, explained in much more detail in terms of the guidance and the technical specification, as well as how you measure each of those surface cover types. So here on this slide, on the first surface cover type of semi-natural vegetation, the right-hand column describes that in more detail, how you'd use uh, British standards uh, and other industry recognized uh, guidance um, to specify and check that you have the right specification of those surface cover types and how you'd measure them. And then to support that, if we pop to the next slide, the model um, uh, urban greening factor for England includes reference and guidance to uh, a broad range of literature tied in with each of those surface cover types. So here it gives you a flavor of the British standards that one can drill down to to access and understand how to specify those surface cover types, um, along with guidance illustrated on the left hand side. And if we then pop to the next slide, um, you can see, for example, reference across to the SUDS manual, which then drills down into the SUDS delivery in much more detail, or the green roof uh, code, the GROW green roof code, which is referenced in detail in the urban greening factor. So that kind of gives you a flavor of the surface cover types and, and, and how you'd apply it. Let's just look at an example, a theoretical model for uh, calculating the urban greening factor. 
So here we've got a site on the left. It's a simple site of 100 square meters, micro site. But what we're doing is just using that for ease of, of calculation. And if you had come to develop that in a proposal with a building uh, in that footprint, uh, you would then introduce a range of urban greening measures uh, within the site, both associated to the building and the site itself, drawing no doubt on national design guides, modern national design code and other guidance, including um, Natural England's uh, published green infrastructure design guide that was also launched at the same time as the standards. So we pop to the next slide and we can see an indicative scheme uh, shown that includes wetlands, food growing areas, formal lawns, some tree planting, hedgerows, etc. And each of those areas which you would calculate is then multiplied by the urban greening factor that we've talked about earlier. And then that's all calculated through and provides you in this example <clears throat> of an urban greening factor of 0.31. And if you are looking to achieve a target score of 0.4 for say a predominantly residential development, you're not quite there yet. And so if we look at the next slide, the introduction of extensive biodiverse green roofs and intensive bio biodiverse green roof would enhance your urban greening factor. So it add further weighting to the to the to the score. And as you look at the way that is calculated, you come up with a score of 0.46 in this theoretical site here. And that then um, uh, meets and actually just exceeds that target score of 0.4 in the example that we've provided here as a theoretical test. And with the tool, we provide a spreadsheet. So the next slide um, shows you the spreadsheet. And it is a simple exercise of putting in the total area of the um, surface cover type that you have. The ones in my theoretical scheme are, co are colored in red. And it auto calculates as you'd exp accept, expect Excel to do so. Uh, and then that calculates down through to development site um, urban greening factor score. So that is a pretty straightforward process. And the GLA and Southampton also provide you uh, with tools, which I'm sure they'll explain shortly. And so uh, this is kind of the process that's used in planning now. And I'll pop to um, the next slide, which shows an example of a development in Merton, London Borough of Merton, um, Watercress Island specifically. But in the uh, design and access statement and uh, the landscape um, scheme and statement, the urban greening factor is described, the surface cover types are described, and the calculation is made. And so the theoretical example that I've just shown you is demonstrated here in practice in a, in a, in a live planning application <clears throat> that was um, submitted in uh, 2021. And in this case, it scored uh, a score of 0.54. And so I am now going to just draw uh, my presentation to a close by just talking about how you fit an urban greening factor to policy and some of the other constituent parts uh, of uh, the suite of uh, uh, green infrastructure standards. So as a reminder, you need to set targets for your land use development. 0.3, 0 0.4 and 0.5 are within the model um, that we have uh, that Natural England launched at the beginning of the year. You want to decide where um, you will apply that urban greening policy. Is that going to be at a, a planning area or a district area? Is it going to be targeted to a, a particular location um, such as a special development site? And where are you going to use the urban greening factor in terms of um, your um, planning uh, development uh, uh, documents? Would it be in a local plan or a neighbourhood plan, perhaps supplementary planning guidance or, or even an agreed infrastructure strategy? And the example here on the right is Portsmouth local plan that sets that um, uh, policy within um, the green infrastructure policy. And so we move to the next slide. As an example here, which I mentioned earlier of um, uh, Swansea, where they have placed their urban greening factor uh, or green space factor tool within the delivery of their uh, green infrastructure standards. So that was their policy vehicle um, and document to, to use the uh, green, uh, urban greening factor. 
and then we pop to the next slide um, and the uh, urban greening factors can be used to target where green infrastructure and particularly types specific types of green infrastructure are needed the most and that might be to address issues of flood risk enhance sustainable drainage perhaps promote areas for children's play enhance biodiversity particularly where there is a, um, a decline in specific habitat types um, or where you want to tackle specific health inequalities and uh, tools around the country, GIS tools, including, say, the GLA Green Infrastructure Focus Map, helps you understand where your investment is going to be um, most beneficial and where it is needed the most. And then in the next slide, we look at how an urban greening factor fits with the accessible green space standard um, that has uh, been uh, developed in parallel by Natural England and updated. And so the uh, accessible green space uh, standard, um, which I won't go into detail here, focuses on access to publicly accessible green space, particularly parks and green spaces, whereas an urban greening factor tool complements that by enhancing urban greening through the development process. So you've got public open space with accessible green space and then an urban greening factor working to enhance the greening of development sites. There is also an interest in the next slide summarised uh, of using urban greening factors, particularly in urban areas, to support the delivery of biodiversity net gain and particularly meeting that 10% gain uh, and beyond. And so an urban greening factor can be used to promote that, um, but also supporting guidance such as the example here with the GLA um, on urban greening and biodiversity net gain to try and ensure that the two work very closely together. And I'm sure the Q&A will have a bit of a further discussion on this. And the last connection um, is uh, to use urban greening factors also to align with local nature recovery strategies uh, to pr prioritise nature recovery, but also to understand where um, your nature recovery strategies and networks are, are most important and aligning an urban greening factor to help achieve that goal. The penultimate slide here is um, rem a reminder very much to um, include a focus on management and maintenance uh, because that is uh, an integral part of not only checking and delivering the biodiversity net gain target with a 30 year management arrangement, but also a means to ensure that the delivery of green infrastructure uh, lasts the test of time through sound management and maintenance. And with that, a very brief uh, overview uh, of the urban greening factor. And, and so now's a good time to pass on uh, to um, uh, Lindsay, um, who uh, I mean, Lindsay McCulloch, who will um, give you an overview from the perspective of Southampton. Um, Lindsay is the natural environment manager um, for the city of Southampton, um, and she will uh, talk to you about applying probably the first example of an urban greening factor in England. So thank you very much for your attention and over to Lindsay. Okay. Thank you, Peter. OK, right, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, really pleased to have the opportunity to talk to everybody about uh, the work that we did on developing our Green Space Factor tool, as we call it. Um, this work well, started over 10 years ago now, so it's really good to see how far the concept has been taken. Um, I'm just going to cover so what, what our Green Space Factor is, the origins of the approach, um, how we develop the tool, what we did to get it into our planning documents, uh, some training that we developed, and then how we've been applying the tools. Um, just quickly, the slide on the right is of the Centenary Key development in Wollstone. It's not uh, been through the green space factor. However, it is my benchmark for green infrastructure in the city uh, and basically what can be delivered. OK, so. Basically, why, why did Southampton City Council go to the effort of developing a green space fact at all? Well, fundamentally, uh, it was a frustration at the lack of objectivity uh, when requesting 
um, sort of habitat mitigation and enhancement measures, um, we'd often get the question back from the developers, well, how much do we need to provide? Uh, why do we need to provide that much? So we felt that there's a tool that, that applied some sort of numbers to this process would be really helpful. We were also really interested in understanding the distribution of um, ecosystem service benefits across the city. We knew the green infrastructure was unevenly distributed um, and by implication the benefits, but it was really difficult to actually explain that clearly to people who sort of non-experts. Um, so we also had um, the confidence of knowing what could be achieved in terms of green infrastructure. Just referring back to the uh, centenary key development that, that I mentioned in the, the previous slide, um, we'd found that if you had a good um, developer, a willing developer, supported by a good ecological consultancy, you could get some really high quality green infrastructure. And in the case of Centenary Key, it was Cress Nicholson uh, and Biodiversity by Design. Um, so who started off with fairly minimal standards of, of green infrastructure, but then as the development has proceeded, they've added more and more. So in terms of the tool that we use, um, we use a very early version, which base, is based on water attenuation. That is a proxy for a series of other um, ecosystem services. So we're looking at infiltration ability, and that works on a score of zero to one, where impermeable surfaces such as tarmac receive a score of one, and surfaces such as woodland, which are totally effectively completely permeable, receive a score of, of one. The so and as Peter explained previously, um, the tool is it's a weighted tool, so the green space factor is applied to the area of each surface type, um, and then the each of the surface types are added up to give your overall score. So for instance, woodland formed half a site, 50% of site, then your green space factor score would be one times 0.5 to give you a score of 0.5. So how did we come across the tool or the concept of it? Well, Southampton was one of the partners in the GRABS project, which was basically looking at the use of green infrastructure for climate change adaptation. And it had a particular focus on developing policy as well as practical tools to enable local authorities to actually plan for climate change adaptation and integrate measures into their planning documents. Another of the projects, as Peter's already met, another project partners of as Peter's already mentioned, was the city of Malmo. And we were able to work with um, Annika Krusa, who was the author of the, the expert paper on the Green Space Factor tool. And we were taken around the Western Harbour development, which was the development site that the tool was developed to support. That tool has a lot of the work to, um, is based on a lot of the work by Berlin, but they had added extra elements such as um, additional scoring for biodiversity enhancements. We felt that this was probably a little bit complicated, so we just focused on the use of scoring for different surface types. So our initial interest in the grain space factor tool was actually to understand the spatial distribution across the city. Um, so that we could very quickly and simply quantify the climate change benefits that were going to be delivered. Um, we, were only, we were aware that, as I've said, that there was uneven distribution, but um, previously we hadn't been able to express that clearly. But with the use of thematic maps, such as the ward map that you can see here, it's very easy to see those areas of the city that will be adversely affected by climate change measures, i.e. Um, intense rainfall, um, and those areas that will fare 
much better. Having tried that approach at, at a course level, we then thought, right, OK, how can we refine it more? Let's see if we can see the effect of open space that we've got across the city. And this map, which Peter had shown earlier, is a thematic map using lower super output area boundaries. And you can quite clearly see the effect of the green space within that dark red centre area in the middle of the, the city. We've got the orange. Those are our central parks. The green at the top of the, the slide, the dark green is Southampton Common, which grades into the outdoor sports centre, the golf course and the Lordswood Woodlands. So from and then in the southeast corner, there's a, there's a line of green, which is one of our greenways. So showing that to senior managers and councillors can quickly convey um, the distribution of the green infrastructure and, as I said previously, those areas of the city that will be uh, more disproportionately affected by climate change uh, impacts. In developing the tool, we took, uh, it was probably two to three years um, of work, and we were really lucky to have a number of students from the University of Southampton's uh, undergraduate master's course in environmental science. And between ourselves and the students, we adopted two approaches. One was the area based one, which I've just shown you some maps from, and that used master map layers. And the other one was site based, which used an Excel spreadsheet. So the initial step was to develop our mapping tool. And essentially we looked through the master map layers, selected those layers that represented green infrastructure and were present in the city. And then we took the scoring that Malmo had developed and we looked at some of the other tools and we applied those scores to each layer. So essentially we added another column to the attributes table and we linked a, a score to each of the different master map layers. We also integrated our own grounds maintenance uh, layer as well, which had sort of higher detail in terms of landscape plots and things. We were then able to use the tool to produce the thematic maps that I've shown. So using ward boundaries and lower super output area. We also ran a query and calculated a score for the whole city, which turned out to be 0.38. And we did a similar exercise using our city centre boundary. And that had a score of 0.19, which showed a clear difference uh, and obviously much lower level of uh, green infrastructure and consequent benefits in the city centre. Then we decided that we needed to just test the uh, distribution of the scores across the city. So we ran a an exercise using 300 random sample plots and calculated the scores for one hectare plots. And you can see in the picture here, um, we've got some of those plots. And this is the distribution of our sample plots. So we've got the red ones in the on the, the left hand side, that's for the city centre. The blue ones for the, were for the wider city. And then the line at 0.4 was the average for the city centre, for the whole city. So clearly we were able to see that actually the, the distribution uh, wasn't, was fairly evenly spread. Um, but with the city centre, it was reasonably concentrated, and that was useful for actually determining our target scores further on in the process. Right, so we then tested um, the idea of applying uh, green roofs to all the city, all the roofs in the city centre, and found that we could significantly improve the green infrastructure, uh, the, the green space factor score. So, having sorted out our map version, we then decided that uh, rather than reinvent the wheel, we would use the Excel sheet that had been created by um, the Mercy Forest team. Uh, and that's the one that we took forward for our uh, city centre action plan. So in order to use the tool, we needed a policy hook. So we were working on our city centre action plan and we were able to include uh, a requirement to use the green space factor tool in the green infrastructure policy that we had in our uh, local uh, our city centre action plan. So and that's policy AP12, green infrastructure and open space. 
before we ran the consultation on our city centre action plan, we decided that we probably ought to do a little bit of a training exercise to see if people really grasp the understanding of the tool. So we ran a workshop um, using some Lego and we set, uh, we gave a, a presentation on what the tool was about, the concepts, and then we divided the teams up, the, the participants up into teams and gave them a little brief to create a development with the highest green space factor score. Um, and after some initial um, obsession with detail, um, the teams, the penny finally dropped and the teams came up with some really good scores. Um, so we were happy that actually as a concept, it was straightforward for people to understand. So this is our current tool. It's a lot simpler than the version that Peter has just been showing you. And as you can see, there's the equation underpinning the spread, the, the, the calculations. We produced a guidance document just to help people complete the spreadsheet. and we, showed, we provided a representative uh, layout of a development site just to get people to enable people to understand what we were looking for. So we've been applying the tool for about eight years now, um, and generally it's worked OK. Um, although, as you can see from this case study, um, this particular site's a hotel development. Um, they filled the, the spreadsheet in and they've achieved um, a significant increase on, in green space factor score for the site. But as you can see from the aerial photo, there was an area of roof that wasn't actually used. So there was scope for more. Um, but unfortunately, that was probably uh, outside the developer's budget. Um, basically, we found um, that it's very difficult to insist on particular features if you haven't got that in policy as well. And we don't have a policy at the moment requiring green roofs. So that, that was a missing opportunity. Um, the other fact problem that we came across was green space factor school scores are not a good um, way of delivering bi true biodiversity improvements. A lot of the landscaping is ornamental and you need to be able to go through those schemes um, in fine tooth detail to actually make sure that the species that are used are actually of benefit to um, biodiversity. And that's why going forward, we are going to be um, using both the biodiversity net gain and the green space factor tool in our local plan that we're working on at the moment. Um, and just finally, there was a couple of comments in green that we got from the workshop that we undertook and the responses that we, we gave to those comments, which hopefully show how the tool should be used. And now I would like to hand you over to Sam Davenport, who is the um, Principal Policy Officer for the, in the Green Infrastructure Team in Greater London Authority. And she's gonna talk us through the maintenance aspect of the urban greening factor. Over to you, Sam. Great, thanks very much indeed. In terms of talking about maintenance, I'm not going to be talking about the maintenance of the actual green infrastructure, but more um, sort of the experience we've had going through putting a UGF in, into policy and having that adopted. And I saw there were quite a few messages in the chat asking about how that's worked. Um, and sort of how what we've done since that point to support implementation of the policy and, and what we've learned along the way. Um, and I'll also reflect on how this kind of approach works with biodiversity net gain policies. Um, before we start, just a very quick word about the planning sort of policy framework in London, because it is slightly different to everywhere else in the country. So the mayor um, is required to produce a number of strategies, including a strategic um, plan for London um, to do with spatial development and planning um, but actually it's the London boroughs who are the local planning authority for pretty much all um, developments in London and we have 32 boroughs the city of London and two development um, agencies at the moment so that's 35 local planning authorities in London and the um, development plan for these LPAs is formed by the London plan and the local plan in combination so that, that's quite an important point for sort of the rest of the presentation. Um, why did we decide to do a UGF, sort of go with the UGF approach? Really quite similar to a lot of the um, 
points that Lindsay raised, so I won't so won't dwell on that too much. Um, we had some excellent examples of really, really well thought out, innovative green infrastructure happening on developments in London. Um, this is the Olympic Park, which is obviously quite a famous and unique example. There are also sites like Kidbrook Village, which is a bit of a poster boy for biodiversity net gain, actually, um, used for quite a lot of the promotional material around that, that was a collaboration between um, developers, um, Barclay and London Wildlife Trust. But this just wasn't happening often enough. Um, and in the context of sort of the climate and ecological emergencies, we also had sort of very high predicted population growth for the city and the city was becoming denser. We wanted to look at a new way of sort of accelerating the greening of the city and the, um, improving the quality of the greening that was provided through development. And we knew that planning policy could really work to do this. Um, about 10 years before we introduced the UGF policy, the London plan had included what's known as the green roof policy, which didn't set out a target, but set out an expectation that um, major development should include green roofs. And this really drove an uptake of green roofs. You can see the details there. So we knew it would work well, but we also knew that that uptake was greatest in inner London boroughs and that we needed um, other types of major development to include higher quality green infrastructure. So policy development, how did we introduce the UGF into the London plan? So we leaned very heavily on, on what had gone before, actually. Um, Peter showed that timetable of um, sort of the, the iterations of this kind of approach going back many years. Um, we had the work that uh, uh, sort of Lindsay mentioned, one of our colleagues who was at the GLA at the time, Peter Massini, was one of the co-authors for um, this TCPA Perfect project that looked at experience from other places. And what came through really strongly for that actually was that simplicity was really important. The more complicated a UGF came, the sort of further away you got potentially from it delivering the policy aim of improving the quality and quantity of greening. Um, and so from that evidence, we produced a very quite short actually um, document proposing how an urban greening factor for London could work, looking at some examples of um, where sort of schemes and how they were scoring um, that we submitted as part of our London plan evidence um, for the examination in public. But really importantly as well, um, the urban greening factor was also included in the viability study for the London plan. Um, so they they looked at the different types of greening that could be covered by the UGF and incorporated those costs into the external works cost applied in the testing. Um, I think if anything, actually, they were potentially a little bit over cautious in some of the costings. Um, and, at, and even with that, it still showed that um, it, something like the UGF represents a really modest cost as a proportion of development value and wouldn't have a significant impact on viability. So next stage was taking the policy forward um, in our draft Lon um, London plan, which was published at the end of 2017 for consultation. Um, we put the policy forward as part of a wider chapter on green infrastructure and it's policy G5 urban greening. And I'll go through the detail of that um, on the next slide. I'm not going to go into the detail of what the what our UGF is like and how it works, because the national one is very similar to it that Peter's just been through in detail. There's some slight differences in terms of um, the types of surface cover you can select and the scores, but they're only very minor and it works in exactly the same way. Um, I've included this list of other policies here because this is a really key point, I think, from our experience of introducing the UGF um, in terms of it working at the point of sort of development management, but also in terms of um, bringing people on board with the UGF was that it works well in sort of a wider planning policy framework for green infrastructure. We're not expecting the UGF to do everything around green infrastructure. We have what I call sort of our protect policies 
in the plan as well. So protection of open space, biodiversity and access to nature, trees and woodlands, for example. And the point that the UGF kicks in is when those policies have been satisfied, the principle of development sort of been established in the local plan process, when a site is being taken forward, the UGF then sits out, sets out rather, sorry, an expectation for what is enough greening to contribute to London's green infrastructure network. And I think this was really important actually to be able to show this at the examination in public because um, I've likened it a little bit to play your cards right before we, because we put forward the same um, scores that have been used for the national UGF, so 0 0.3 for um, commercial development and 0 0.4 for residential. And we had people saying they should be higher, they should be lower, different um, surface cover types in the UGF should have the scores changed. But I think it really, we were able to give the inspector a lot of confidence about that that wasn't necessary because we have this wider policy framework. Um, and also what gave the inspectors sort of confidence in the policy was that the viability assessment and also we were able to provide just a few examples of schemes that were already sort of meeting these kind of um, greening levels. So they were meeting the UGF scores already without the policy being adopted. And this is the policy. Um, we called it urban greening and not the UGF deliberately because the objective of the new policy is to ensure that urban greening is considered as a fundamental element of site and building design, that it's considered early on in the process. It sort of isn't just the greening of spaces left around buildings or on top of buildings. Um, and the UGF is the tool by which we evaluate if there is a sort of appropriate level of greening being provided and how we can set the targets. And um, there's been some questions in the chat about um, sort of different authorities adopting UGF policies. So there's quite a few examples of London boroughs now that have their own urban greening factor policy in their local plan. And so obviously that's been through examination as well. And, and have been sort of accepted and taken forward. Today, all of the boroughs have used our, our scores. And I think that's in large part because of the viability aspect, because we tested that at the London plan level. And also because it's quite a new policy. And I do think as um, evidence or more evidence is developed and people get more familiar with the policy, we'll see boroughs starting to set their, their own scores that are more locally specific. So um, we've got it into policy, but you know that's only the start. We really, it was a new policy, as I said, 35 local planning authorities. We knew we had to do a lot of work to support the implementation of the policy. First off was um, drafting London plan guidance. This is the same as an SPG um, for a local plan. Um, and this covered sort of all the, the techie bits, as I call it, that like everyone was really interested in the detail, a bit like Lindsay was saying, like, how do you exactly measure this? What happens in this very specific scenario? And we had workshops with over sort of 100 local authority officers to um, get feedback here, how it was working for them, provide some training. And we collated sort of FAQs from applications that came into the GLA as referable submissions to the mayor. Um, so that's for applications of strategic importance. And so we cover the kind of things in the guidance that you'd expect to see. And a lot of this is what Peter's sort of run through. It's similar for the national guidance. Um, and we also include options in there for setting UGF targets in local plans for boroughs, which might be um, interesting for people outside of London still who are, who are looking at this. But ultimately, so yes, there's a calculation to do and we've published all this detailed guidance on how to assign things to different categories and how to measure it. But um, a lot of what we've focused on around communication is just promoting this message that the urban greening factor is a tool to inform decisions. Um, it isn't the answer. You don't put your numbers into the urban greening factor and it tells you what the right type of greening is on a, on a site. There's local context, but there's also site specific constraints and context to take into account, like microclimate and, and the use of the greening. And so people are needed for that and, and data and information. 
Um, so this is a point we really laboured, I guess, in the in our um, planning guidance. We set out really clearly where we thought the greening provided to meet the UGF can meet other policy requirements. That's box left on on the one, oh, sorry, box one on the left. Um, and we we included really clear steer. Um, I've included a paragraph here from our guidance about signposting people to think about urban greening being a, a tool to improve the quality of development and the outcomes from the development. We've also made available data and tools to support the local planning authorities in London and developers to consider what kinds of greening might be most appropriate on a site, um, where green infrastructure could help address local needs. And this is our green infrastructure focus map and that pulls together um, sort of different data sets on different environmental and social issues um, into one place. Um, we will be updating this because actually we've taken sort of some feedback and I, uh, which I think is very valid that this works quite well um, for site specific queries. So you can look at a development site, for example, and have a fairly good understanding of some of the local issues, but where it, it doesn't work so well is thinking about green infrastructure more strategically at the LPA level, um, which is relevant because in the London plan, we also recommend and direct boroughs to prepare their own green infrastructure strategies. Um, and again, I think once boroughs have started to go through that process of collating data, preparing their own green infrastructure strategies, we'll see more um, developing their own local targets. Um, get asked a lot about how the UGF and BNG work together. Um, our experience is fairly well, they are different. Um, BNG works, sort of it's an uplift based on what's there already. UGF sets out sort of a minimum requirement. So for that set, um, because of that, we find actually the UGF is often a better um, tool to promote biodiversity gains through development in London, where we have most of our development happening on previously development previously development sites and by that I don't mean really um, wildlife rich brownfield sites. Um, so we also have developed um, an urban greening for biodiversity net gain design guide with our local wildlife trust London Wildlife Trust and what that does is um, because not all greening is sort of equal in terms of its benefit for wildlife it takes the surface cover types in the UGF there on the left and then it quite quite sort of top level ranks the biodiversity potential of those kind of surface cover types and sets out some design con considerations that are relevant to to help um, meet that potential. And we, we include some design guides in there. So sort of on the left, the larger graphic is looking, it provides an example of how you can um, pull out sort of the valuable biodiversity features and integrate them into a development where this site is next to a railway line, for example. And we also provide some sort of more detailed design guidance um, for features such as these, these habitat options for SUDS. But I guess the key question is, sort of, is it working? Um, this is what everyone wants to know. So we're, um, I think, mainly local planning authorities um, on the call and you all know sort of the, the challenges of <laughs> monitoring so but we're, we're getting there and we are starting to increase the data we have so a couple of years ago a new planning data hub for London was introduced and this is a shared data hub where boroughs and developers actually add information about schemes from um, I think from validation through to completion and it's been a, a relative sort of it's been a, a, a process getting all the, the LPA signed up to this. But I think all now we're on. So we're, um, we ask people to record UGF scores as part of this. We don't look at the detailed breakdown because we thought that was too much data to, to collect and try and analyse. But what we are looking at now is score, we'll be able to look at scores um, that different types of developments and in different locations are achieving. And the latest data we have from this is that for over 2,000 applications since early January 22, 
there's an average score of 0.32 being achieved. Um, so that combines the 0.3 and 0.4 targets we have for commercial and residential. Um, but as we get more data, we'll start to, to split that out so we can look at those two thresholds. Um, the mayor also, um, oh, sorry, Borough is also as part of the planning process for strategically important um, applications. And that's essentially large master plan kind of level applications, very tall buildings, et cetera, have to refer cases to the, the mayor, the GLA's DM team have a look at um, that. And so we've been collating some data for the last sort of 10 months or so, looking at how scores are um, schemes of scoring coming into us and as you can see there um, they're generally meeting or just above um, the target though whether that's because they know they're coming to the GLA and will be more closely scrutinized we, we don't know but um, again we sort of want to make this data available so that our local planning authorities can use it um, to develop their own policies um, and then, then we've got about a uh, minute left I think Great, thanks. So I think I'll be able to whip through that. And then the other side of monitoring, I guess, is sort of the, the softer stuff. I don't even know you could call it qualitative because we're not collecting information in a systematic way. But like, what are people saying about the UGF? So this is just one example. I thought I put it. I put in to talk through that. It's a, um, a hotel development in sort of in a London, East London. Um, where the UG, it was quite an early scheme that we saw come in and the UGF actually was really valuable in increasing the amount of greening on this site. So this is what came into us. It looks pretty green, doesn't it? Um, the, this is from the design and access statement. It talks about a pocket park. You've got pergola arches, um, planting scattered through the car park trees. But the UGF um, score was 0.17 and it allowed us to interrogate a bit more and sort of all that green around the edge and in the middle is permeable paving or reinforced grass um so so we weren't um the borough and the gla weren't um satisfied with this from a design point of view um that we felt there was too much car parking on the site anyway because it's very well served by public transport and having the UGF um, allowed us to have a discussion and set some clear expectations with the applicant about what was enough and the quality that was accepted. And the second revision that came back in um, was this, which was a uh, um, comfortably exceeded the target. So they have kept some car parking, um, but the main change has been um, to that area in the, the bottom um, right hand corner where a path has been put through um, so that people can come from a crossing across the site and it's a much larger sort of pocket park area and I think if it wasn't for something like the UGF that probably just would have been put over to turf um, whereas now we've got much more interesting landscaping better sort of features for biodiversity and a, and a nicer space that people can use in an area that actually is quite deficient in green space. Um, so my conclusions, the UGF is well evidenced and an accepted approach to increasing the quality and qual quantity, sorry, and quality of greening provided. And there have been a number of policies now in London through EIP. My number one thing to take away, I guess it's a tool, it's not the answer. You still need design professionals involved and that the wider policy framework is important. And as I mentioned, I think it can be a better approach than BNG in urban areas, but it, it works well with it. It doesn't need to be either or. Come out Thanks very section. much, Sam. That's brilliant. Uh, and thank you to, to Lindsay uh, and Peter as well. Some really, really helpful presentations there. Um, I'm going to um, invite the sort of panel to um, to, to, to join us. Um, we've also welcoming Jane Houghton, who's the project manager for the Green Infrastructure Framework from Natural England to the panel. Thanks, Jane, for joining us. Um, so I'd like to um, open the question and answer um, up to uh, the first question, uh, which is from uh, Fiona Fryer. Um, is there any policy basis for requiring these standards from development, i.e. through the National Planning Policy Framework. So, um, Jane, I wonder if we could come to you for that question, would that be okay? Thanks, Claire, and thank you for this question, Fiona. 
So the GI framework and its standards are voluntary, but they fully support the national planning policy framework, and that strongly advises local authorities, of course, to set out a strategic approach to GI in their local plan policies and make sufficient provision for networks of green infrastructure, for biodiversity, health and wellbeing, climate and equality. And the GI standards are also referred to in the National Model Design Code. And under planning reforms, it'll become mandatory for all local planning authorities to prepare their own local design guides or codes for development. But Natural England is also providing advice to DLUC and DEFRA on how to incorporate the uh, GI framework into planning reforms, into their review of the uh, national planning policy framework, and also developing the national development management policies and planning practice guidance. OK, thanks. And back to you, Claire. Yeah, thanks, Jane. That, that's really helpful. Um, I mean, not surprisingly, there are quite a few questions in in the Q and A uh, and also comments in the chat around the links with biodiversity net gain. Um, so, Will Horsfall um, has asked: um, Should biodiversity net gain be taken into account in calculating the UGF? Um, and I'm wondering, um, Peter. Um, whether we can come to you on that one and then perhaps to, to Jane and, and Sam as well. Sam's got quite a bit of experience in terms of the links with BNG. Um, yeah, sure, Claire. And um, absolutely, I, I, because obviously BNG uh, is now mandatory and there's a lot of focus on, on delivering that 10% um, net gain. Um, I think the interesting point that Sam made and um, may expand on this was really that um, BNG is an uplift, whereas uh, urban greening factor is a minimum uh, greening. And in urban situations, sometimes the uplift is quite limited, quite minimal, and 10% of not a lot is not a lot, not a lot. as we're, we're familiar with. Um, Whereas I think the advantage for urban greening factor is that you are actually setting a much clearer uh, target, target depending on the uh, uh, um, land use types, uh, commercial development, residential development, um, that really sets uh, an ambitious goal, this goal for urban for greening. greening. And the way the surface cover types have been set is that they have paid a lot of attention to biodiversity benefit, but the surface cover types are seeking to achieve a whole range of different objectives for amenity, public health, uh, resilience, surface water management. So it is um, incorporated, biodiversity improvement is incorporated, but it's not an exclusive requirement. But the guidance in the urban greening factor does give you a lot of reference through to biodiversity benefit. Um, and I think that is um, reassuring, and uh, certainly fr from listening to Sam's presentation, that the schemes that have come in do demonstrate a significant uh, uplift for, for biodiversity using the urban greening factor tool. Cool. I could say more, but it might be better but to, be to better. Hear, hear from uh, Jane or, or, or Sam further. Yeah, I'm wondering if we could come to, to Sam actually for a bit of a sort of, um, uh, you know, delivery perspective. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Claire and Peter. And I think, yeah, no, I completely agree with Peter's point there. And I am. Um, and the speakers put their mute on just to avoid the. Great, thanks. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's a better. Thanks. Um, yeah, no, I, I completely um, sort of agree. Peter set that out very well, that, that they're very different things and we're trying to achieve very different things with them. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't achieve biodiversity outcomes through the urban greening factor. Um, I feel like I should pre precondition what I'm about to say with that I'm I'm an ecologist. Um, before I came to the GLA, I worked at Natural England as their urban ecology lead. So, you know, it's something I'm very passionate about, but but ultimately um, we're looking for wider outcomes for green infrastructure. And I think also we have to be realistic that sometimes very constrained, dense development sites are not the place to try and deliver um, sort of certain types of wildlife habitat because they're, they're just not going to stand up to sort of the use or the nature of the development. Um, and I take that then back to the point I raised in my presentation about the wider policy framework is key because if a site comes forward 
that has a high existing biodiversity value, then it needs to, the, the proposal needs to meet other policy requirements around biodiversity. Whereas for many sites that we see in London, there's there's very little sort of biodiversity baseline. Um, and the UGF gives us a lot more opportunity to green the site and then to make sure some of that is designed for wildlife. And I think um, certainly I'd like to, I think Barra's will, and I'd like to see a bit more as we get the local nature recovery strategy come through um, to start to think about certain sites where there might, there should be more of a focus on sort of um, biodiversity, ecologically inspired greening as part of the LNRS. Um, whereas in other places, managing surface water or providing green space will be more of a priority. That's great. Thank you, Sam. Um, there was also a, a sort of question um, in the chat around um, and in the question and answer around examples of adopted local plan policies that are already in use. And I think, Sam and Lindsay, you kind of covered this a little bit in your presentations. Um, is there um, or, uh, is there anything else you would like to to add to that or, or Peter, from your perspective? All I would say is we have a policy in our city centre action plan, which we will be improving on for our, our local plan. Um, it's it, it's not proved um, to be a problem at all. Nobody's we haven't had any sort of complaints. Um, what I would say is that the policy needs to be worded very carefully. Um, I'm a little surprised that we have got some significant green infrastructure improvements because when I look at the policy wording, it is actually quite vague and it doesn't say that they have to physically implement. Um, they just have to demonstrate an improvement in the score. Um, and where we have lacked the supporting policies requiring particular types of green infrastructure, then we failed to secure those. So, so yes, the I don't think we even had any particular concerns from the inspector when we went through the examination either. So, um, yeah, it's uh, I can put the actual title of the policy into into the chat so people can check it up. What I would say is we do keep our biodiversity and our green infrastructure policies separate and we will we will continue to do that so claire Brilliant. i'll just add that the research that we undertook um to develop uh the uh, national model for england um did look at the policies that <clears throat> excuse me were available uh, at the time of research um we've done a set of detailed case studies, five uh, in total, which gives you an analysis, not only description, but analysis of the policy, which is very helpful, I think, uh, to the to the question that included um, uh, Southampton, London Borough of Sutton, City of London, which is interesting because it's such a high density uh, district, uh, Greater London Authority uh, and Swansea. Um, but we also in the um, uh, published document, which is um, uh, the, the research work. So it was a development um, and technical guidance document that is available on the web. We provide a comparison of UGF policies used in the UK planning practice. And there are, uh, ooh, I think, at least a dozen going from the ones I've mentioned to the likes of Greater Manchester, London Legacy Development Corporation, Old Oak uh, and Park Royal. So I think there is plenty to draw on, but it is a, an evolving uh, process so there will be you know new policies coming out this year that we haven't captured but we've got a pretty good overview within the published guidance from natural england brilliant thank you very much those are really helpful um responses i've got a couple of questions now on sort of species and sort of tree planting so probably going to come to, to you peter on this these as well so there's there's one which is um, around sort of how tree planting is calculated as part of the UGF. Um, and there's another around guidance on species types for planting, you know, those that are good for perhaps air quality or drought resilience. Um, is that covered in the UGF? So um, 
Peter, I think those are probably ones for you. Uh, is is that is that okay to yeah, come yeah, to you I'm, on those? Yeah, I'm uh, happy to to pick up on these. I also know um, with the London plan guidance that Sam uh, showed, there, there's further detail on how London, for example, measures this. So if I've left any gaps, Sam, do uh, chip in uh, after I finish. But the um, description of the surface cover types, again, in the technical guidance that is published, uh, does give a good level of detail um, on each of the surface cover types and how you would measure them. For trees specifically, we provide two um, uh, weightings. Uh, one is standard or semi-mature trees that are con planted in connected pits, which we uh, value uh, or weight higher than uh, semi-mature trees planted in individual tree pits. And because that provides a stronger basis for a healthy tree growth, um, and those uh, are weighted 0.9 and 0.7 uh, in comparison. Uh, so we do take that into account, but we also steer the reader to Trees and Design Action Group guidance, which again explores this in immense technical detail, incredibly valuable. So I think there is a lot if you go on a journey through the guidance to the supporting specification and, and, and documents, um, you are well covered for tree planting. If you look at, say, um, uh, other habitat types or, uh, say, meadow planting, so there was, I think there's some discussion on the on the uh, uh, sort of question answers about whether we get into enough detail on, on habitat types. Well, for example, with the flower-rich perennial um, uh, and herbaceous planting, which we're promoting for pollinator-rich aesthetically pleasing, attractive approaches to amenity planting. We do reference to work, say, um, and research on designed ecology, which University of Sheffield has led, um, pollinator de demonstration projects from bu bug life, British standards, recommendations of management and maintenance of soft landscapes. So there's quite a lot of detail, again, similar to trees, where you can get further information. And then how you measure those that you get, there was a point about three dimensional landscapes. So you would be measure, measuring not only the ground plane, but also the tree canopy as well. So we take into account the benefits of a three dimensional landscape scheme, particularly uh, uh, additional tree planting, which I think is key. And how that is measured is also nicely illustrated in one diagram in the London plan uh, guidance. But Sam may, I may have covered it, but Sam do say anything else. No, I think that's very comprehensive. I was just going to confirm that, as I said, we just looked at what TDAG have been doing as well, if people are doing some great stuff and are the experts. And um, I think actually just thinking like the question about measuring trees, though, it was making me think about the questions we used to get about some of this, that, yeah, you can get really, it's, it's easy. And I think it's in our, a lot of our nature to get quite hung up in the real detail and the exact measurements. But it's worth remembering sort of what we're trying to achieve through it. So for the two different categories for trees, we're trying to promote trees that are going to have some longevity. So being planted in the right conditions with the right soil volume. Um, so almost if if like we're, we're, there, there's some what I'm trying to say if there, there's a bit of ambiguity around some of the canopy sizes we've just got to have a best guess but the important thing is that we're putting trees in that are, are going to survive um, and aren't going to have to be replaced um, or meet their full growth potential because obviously we need large canopy trees as much as possible in urban areas. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks both. That's really helpful. Um, we've probably just got one time for one last sort of comment before we start to kind of wrap up for the session. I noticed that there was a, a comment, Lindsay, about sharing the Lego workshop details because that sounded really helpful. Um, is that something you're able to do, Lindsay? Um, yes, I'll have a look through uh, our old files and pull together the relevant ones. Fantastic. That's great. OK, I think we probably should uh, wrap up there. Um, just thank you very much to the panel for those really helpful responses. Um, and I think we have got the um, results in from the polls now. So um, very helpful to see that um, 
I think at the start you sort of rated your understanding in this area around uh, just under two and a half, and the at uh, the end um, you've um, that's that has increased to to around three and a half. So hopefully we've done some work in terms of progressing your uh, confidence in this area. Still some some way to go on that. Also interesting to see the the results of the um, the poll on how many of you are currently using the UGF and have policies. So only around 6% of you currently have that, 7% uh, are interested in developing uh, and 37% interested in uh, looking at this further. So there obviously is quite a, an interest out there. So we really hope that today has kind of wet your appetite for this um, and, and helped to sort of point you in the direction of um, some of those uh, people like Sam and, and Lindsay who are already uh, working with this in practice. Um, also, we'd really like you to get involved. Um, so um, if you do have a case study that showcases the UGF or your journey towards the UGF um, and the, the wider green infrastructure framework and the wider standards, then please do get in touch. We're really keen to celebrate and share some of the best examples that we can uh, to promote best practice and, and inspire that uptake. So please do get in touch with the team. I think we've got the email address in the chat. Um, if uh, if we haven't, we will send that round afterwards. So um, it just remains really for me to, um, to, to finish up, to thank all our contributors uh, so much for this morning's session um, and to... Um, uh, to direct you to the green infrastructure portal um, and that will come up on the screen just as we sort of finish the session here please do go and have a look at that if you haven't already done that um, and yeah we thank you for joining us so um, please uh, yeah that's that marks the end of our session today thank you very much <laughs>